You know, we've all been there. Sometimes you're waiting in line and you're at the checkout counter in the supermarket when a headline really grabs your attention. So you're a little curious to see what it's all about. You pick it up and you check it out. But how true are those stories that we read? My guests today say their lives were actually shattered when they became a leading story in a tabloid magazine. And I've been on both sides. I've seen the tabloid magazines, and I've also been in them, just like our guest today. Most of the stories written about me and my family were not only cruel, but also very untrue. Please say hello to Linda Day George. Many of you will remember that Linda starred in the hit series Mission Impossible. That was in the 60s and 70s. Being an actress, Linda says she was used to being in the spotlight and seeing her name in the papers, but then one day a tabloid went too far. What did the article say? Well, first of all, that I was anorexic, which I'm not. <laughs> I never have been. And um, they, they made that statement out of an interview that I had given to a writer. And the writer and I both were at a loss as to where they got that information. Um, she was as surprised as I was. Apparently what had happened was that they had taken her story and it didn't sound as Spicy. Ex exciting, as explicit, as drawing maybe as what they wanted and so they rewrote her they article? rewrote it <laughs> or they changed it around to make it sound a little more interesting well I, I when I read it I was sick I was a sick and I had uh, people who came to me uh, a, a woman at the grocery store came to me because she was struggling with this problem and wanted to know what I could do, what, what could I say to her, what could I do to help her the way I had helped myself. Well, what do you do? How do you, how do you deal with something like that? What do you say to someone? Because if you, if you say, uh, I don't have that, then uh, it's kind of then, like putting the other person down. Exactly. Well, you then do, and I I'm, did something. Yeah, and I betrayed them. Or they don't believe you, and right. it sounds like you're in denial. Why, why doesn't Linda tell the truth exactly. about what this is? Exactly. So you're put in a terrible position right. because there are millions of people who really suffer from right. this and do need help. I mean, I've had that same thing, people giving me condolences exactly. and things, and I go, you don't understand. But wait. It, it isn't true. <laughs> Yes. Exactly. My, uh, my husband had clients who would ask him questions about me and my problem. Was anything written in the article true? No. Nothing? No. Oh, dear me. There was, I, I don't really recall, I don't recall any truth in the article. Of course, I've only read it. 15 times, so it could be that I missed something. Now, there are people who would say, Linda, only one article, why should one article hurt so much? It only takes once. That's it right. only takes one time being hit by a car for it to hurt you. Did you ever think about legal action? I thought about legal action, and then I realized, you know, I, when Carol Burnett went through the difficulty and the agony that she went through, with her lawsuit, it it was, it was, it was real hard to watch all that go go on when someone had been lied about and and maligned in that way. Especially a wonderful, uh, much loved lady an like Carol Burnett. Incredible, loving, wonderful woman, and and to have them, them, the big <laughs> them, again out there saying things that were just a, a lie and have her fighting constantly fighting to get the truth heard was it was very difficult to watch that and to know too that they're not they don't have to print the truth now linda didn't wasn't she the first celebrity to have won a lawsuit yes. against that's why when y we talk yes. about uh, carol burnett that's what we're discussing and i think she yes. she battled it and ba but it would take somebody like a carol burnett to exactly. battle it and battle it and battle it exactly and i realized that that um I wasn't going to hurt them or stop them right. or, you know, and once it's out, cause it's them out, any right? big deal. They, they could care less. I mean, they've got money set aside for all those kind of things that 
we've never even heard of before, those kinds of figures. It's ridiculous. Did you talk to a lawyer? And what did the lawyer tell you? Well, um, the only person that I talked to about this was not a, an attorney who would handle uh, that kind of a big, you know, that kind of a, a, what would you call it, public suit like that. But he said that um, this was not the kind of thing that would be worthwhile in pursuing because That's they right have there. extremely deep pockets and they don't care. That's what they tell you, by the way, when people say, uh, well, if it's not true, why don't you sue? The answer is, in, in the long run, you're somehow going over it, validating it, and exactly. you're not going to win. I'd like you to meet Pauline. Pauline says she is no stranger to Linda's feelings. On two separate occasions, Pauline did mm. sue the tabloid that wrote false stories about her and her employer. What happened? Um, hi. Um, I'm a nurse, and I, uh, but prior to being a nurse, I had done um, quite a few years ago a little modeling and acting, but I wasn't comfortable being in the limelight, and I wanted my privacy, so, and I wanted to help people, so I chose to become a nurse, and it was like a vocation to me. And I worked at St. John's Hospital in Santa Monica for almost seven years, and then I started doing private duty nursing. And I started working with um, quite a few different celebrities. And, um, well, I was in quite a few tabloids, and it was always very upsetting to me. But at one point, they really went too far. With this one patient of mine in particular, he's an older gentleman, I'm a young female, the paparazzis would take pictures of us and want to write these stories. So in the beginning, I was naive to what was going on. But then after I saw what, what they would do with some of these stories, then I, would, then I stopped going in front of the camera to protect myself. So I was um, at a film festival with this uh, older gentleman patient in France. And the, I refused to go in front of the camera for any of the pictures. And they kept trying to encourage me to do that all week. And then the very last day, right before we left, um, the photographer said, um, well, why don't I just take a few pictures for your own scrapbook, just for the memories. Oh. And uh, you, you have my word that these will not be used. And I was still really uncomfortable with mm -hmm. it. And I had my arms crossed like this. And so they used lines like this. Um, well, move in a little closer. I can't get you in the frame, you know? And then, uh, so I moved in a little bit. And he said, well, you look like you hate him, you know? Why don't you look a little friendly? Or here's this flower. So he hands me a little daisy. So when they take the picture, I'm like looking like this, holding this flower. And it looks like he loves me, he loves me not. And then they write this caption. And they wrote things like uh, that I was his live-in love. And, and then when we went to trial, how they defended that is, they said, because I had done some night shifts there. So they equated that with a live-in situation. And then they said, well, do you hate him? Do you, do you have any love for this person? And I do, because I've worked with him for years. But there's you know, different types of love. And to make me look like, what they did is they made me look like a sleazy nurse that sleeps uh. with her patients. And so I brought the case to this one um, lawyer. And he presented it to the Globe, was the tabloid this time. <coughs> And uh, within a week, he called me and he said, this is great. I can't believe it. I've never had a, an offer so quick from any case. So we settled for the minimal amount. And I thought, in my naivety, that I had taught them a lesson. A year and a half later, I was in, a, I think it was a Safeway market at the time. And my girlfriend was at the other end of the store. And she saw on the cover my picture blown up and another article that was even worse, that made uh. me look worse. And she yelled, yeah. Pauline, across the store. And I looked up, and she pointed. Yeah. And I looked at the paper, and everyone in line turned around and looked at me. And I looked at this, and I was so upset because of what I had gone through. And I only told you part of it. And I didn't go into all the details. Was it the same newspaper? It was the same one. It was the Globe again. And so I took the stack Wait, of papers. Wait, you, you, uh, reached a set, you sued them, reached a settlement. They, they printed a retraction. And then one year later, they did it again? A year and a half later, uh. they did the same thing, but worse. And so I took the stack of papers, and I ran into an aisle, because everyone was looking at me. And I'm not a hysterical type of personality. And I'm usually pretty calm. And I just started shredding these papers <laughs> oh, the no. in the frozen food yes. section. I was just so upset. We went to trial. And the, as horrible as the article and the lies were, the trial was even worse. Because they have 12 lawyers working on it at all times. And the Globe isn't just the Globe. They had. I think I was told 22 major publications from 
Brides Magazine to Children's Everywhere. too. I mean, it's a major company. And so, um, so what happened is they just made stuff up. And what they can do in these trials is they, the jurors don't have to vote on the case, even though they're supposed to. As long as they can turn the jury against you and get the jury not to like you and make them think yes. you're highly paid or you're not a nice person or you're this or that by making stuff up, and it worked. And the jurors came up to me after, and they said, we want to punish them, but you're going to be fine. You have a good job, and you, you know. Oh. And uh, it was horrible. And it's hard to, it's, I, you know, I try to just suppress so, it and move on, but it's. Uh, how, how are you now? Are you all right? Um, well, I won't ever go in front of, uh, you know, out in public with any of my clients, and I'm um, getting out of nursing, and uh, I, um, um, you know, I, you know, I have a lot of faith, and I have a positive attitude, so I try to, mm. you know, just go on, and you know, there's a lot of good things in my life too, but it hasn't been easy, but. Um, you know, I, I feel like this show is a really good cause. I've been contacted by all the other shows to um, go in front of the camera because of these celebrities I work for, and I would never do that because yeah. I wouldn't break the confidentiality. But this was a really good purpose. I think it's a really good message for this show. For people to know. Not yes. to buy the tabloids, not to read them. <laughs> Later, we're going to talk exclusively with a woman who is suing a tabloid for comparing her to a baby elephant and a small family car. You'll want to know what she's doing about it. Stay with us. I think tabloids just give you the dirt, you know, the nitty gritty. Everybody wants to hear the dirt, not the truth. I think too many people are too bored with their own lives. And it's the whole living vicariously, even if it's vicious, it's a lot more exciting than what you have at home. I like hearing the gossip about what's going on with people and the stars, and it's interesting. If they name names, I mean, you know, the three-headed alien born to Bigfoot on the moon sort of thing. But when they name names, you know, like so-and-so is having an affair with so-and-so, they have to be held accountable for that. I guess we're talking about tabloids. You've been there. If you have a big laugh with your friends about a story in one of the tabloids, did you ever wonder about the other side? and if or how the stories could hurt people. Well, we're talking today about tabloid newspapers and the people are hurt by them. Just how true are the stories? Please meet LaDoris and Jacqueline. Jacqueline or Jacqueline? Jacqueline. Jacqueline. They say they too were plastered all over different tabloids and everything that was written about them couldn't have been further from the truth. LaDoris, we're gonna start with you. Uh, you had been making a living working as a cook for different celebrities. Should we call you Chef? Cook. Chef LaDoris. Okay. okay. Most <laughs> recently, you worked for Elizabeth Taylor, and that's what the story was about. Tell me what happened. I worked for Elizabeth Taylor for about six weeks. I quit. I um, went to get another job. Uh, one day the agency called and said they had a job for me and that I had been highly recommended and that the, it was for a producer director who was too busy to interview me so they wanted this lady to interview me. I went on the interview. Where was the interview? Where did it take place? In Beverly Hills on Durant Street. Okay. I, I went on the interview. I met the lady who was to interview me and she asked, started off with the normal questions of, of uh, your references. So I answered. And then she proceeded to ask me about Elizabeth Taylor. And so I told her, you know, that I had worked there and I left and that was it. Um, about 30, maybe 30, 35 minutes into the conversation, this man comes in, comes into the room where we were, and he asked me questions. And uh, he talked and he talked, and then he said, I guess I better tell you who I am. And I looked at him, and I didn't recognize him. And I looked at him, and he says, so I asked him, who are you? And he told me his name, and he worked for the National Enquirer. And he wanted information on Elizabeth Taylor and her husband. He offered me X amount of dollars to tell him about certain things, and I told him no. I told him I had a reputation to, ha you know, and I would not tell him 
any information on anyone that I work for except the regular information that you give out. Right. So he proceeded to tell me how, how much money he could get me at a certain amount of time if I would tell him, the, uh, give him the information he wanted. And I turned him down. Good for you. found yourself on the pages of the National Enquirer, what happened? Um, when I found out about the article... What did the article say? Um, to the effect of Elizabeth Taylor fire, fires the chef for making her fat, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> Unbelievable. But what she did not fire me. And you did not make her fat? And I did not make her no fat. Chef. <laughs> no chef. No chef. No chef, no cook, make somebody fat. <laughs> For goodness sakes, what did you think? When I saw the article? Yeah. Uh, first, I was, I sit there and I looked at it because when I found out about the article, my daughter in Virginia called me in California to tell me about the article in the paper. I go down to buy the paper. Here I am in the paper. I look like a, a, a Macy's Day balloon with two sticks. Oh. Um, <laughs> So uh, I got angry because when I read it, it wasn't true. And so I don't like for someone to tell stories on me that's not true. And that was not true. So I did not make her fat. She did not fire me. <laughs> Why did you decide to get legal help? Because what they said about me was a lie. This is uh, Ladoris's attorney, Ken Kazan. Ken, stand up. I know there are limitations on what you can talk about in LaDoris's case, but what did you sue for and were you successful? Well, we had a uh, four uh, cause of action complaint. We sued for libel, invasion of privacy, and um, two cause of action for emotional distress, negligent and intentional. And all I can say about uh, the case is that it's been concluded and it's over. Okay, good. Were you successful? Do you feel you were successful? I think both my client and I are satisfied. Okay. Uh, one last question. Are most cases like Ladoris's won or most cases lost? I think most cases of this nature usually settle. And I can tell you in this particular case, I wrote a letter to the inquirer asking for a retraction before any lawsuit was ever filed. They wrote a letter back saying, we've researched the story, it's true. I wrote another letter to the attorney asking for a retraction. They wrote another letter back saying, we're not going to do a retraction the lawsuit was filed. Can you imagine? All right, thank you. I thought maybe we'd say hello to uh, Doug, if that's uh, all right with you. Uh, this is Linda's husband, and um, he was been... <laughs> the results of this on your family and on Linda, anything she didn't tell us? How hard was she hit? Well, Sally, she... Uh... She's, she, uh, along with my mother, she's the most precious woman in the world, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, I don't think she would let many people uh, feel the brunt of what she takes inside. So uh, as important as her life is to her and, and the possibility of what she wants to do in the future, I think it hurt her real deep inside. And then she didn't let that out much. In fact, today is the first time I've heard uh, some of it come out. Good, thank you. There you go. Thank you. Of course, she's got every reason to be proud of him, too, right? Uh, oh, yes. I didn't need to say that for you, right? Uh -huh. is, he a, is he a decent husband? Oh, my God. Uh, I wish him on everybody. <laughs> All right. That's as nice a thing as you can say. How long have you had him? I've had him. <laughs> Five years? Five Still going years. strong? Good. Yeah. I would like you to meet Jacqueline. Jacqueline was working as a high fashion model when she found herself on the cover of The Sun. And we have that picture. What happened, Jacqueline? I was uh, working in Hamburg at the time when the photograph was taken. And I had done, decided to do a test for a friend of mine that was uh, wanting to become a makeup artist. So she set me up with a friend of hers this photographer who took photographs, uh, so basically for her sake, 
so that she could learn the makeup and, and build a portfolio for herself. And he had asked me to do a test as well. And a test is said, when photographer I, takes uh, exactly. pictures of a model that have not been paid for, but uh, it's done a great deal, right? Right, yes. exactly. It's to try new lighting or yeah. new makeup or new hairstyles or build your own book. Sometimes models will have a lot of tests in their book just to show different looks for themselves. So I agreed to do this, and he said that he could sell them to a magazine in Hamburg. So we had done this on a couple of occasions, and it was a legitimate magazine in Hamburg, and I was paid after the fact. Uh, but in this case, this was one of the photographs, obviously, that was not of the right quality to be. It obviously didn't turn out very well. So he still wanted to make some form of money. Well, wait, so I think, I I think they're laughing. We have to say it's, it's, that the photograph that they're looking at behind oh, you okay. is, uh, <laughs> is not All the right. photograph in question. Because okay. you're going to say that didn't turn out very well. well. Uh, <laughs> what, what was done to that photograph? Well, uh, apparently. Uh, I have no idea how they do this. I really don't. I assume that it's done on a computer. And I assume that it was not the photographer that did this. It was the, the magazine that did this after they probably manipulated How did you the find photograph. out about the picture? A friend of mine um, on the North Shore in Vancouver, which is where I reside, was in a grocery store buying something for her daughter, a little teddy bear, and saw this at the checkout stand at just about had just about <laughs> dropped her child right in the aisle and uh, picked up a copy, drove down to another friend of mine's office, and from there she confirmed as well that it was me. And so they called me down to the office. They said, you've got to get down here. This is just unbelievable. You're not going to believe what we have found. And I'm going, I had no idea what could possibly have happened. So I went down there and I was just, I, I looked at it, I was just in shock. I mean, I was hysterical. I, I, it, it really bothered me the most because um, I just don't think that they should be able to get away with this. Well, I think it would bother you. Why? If, uh, why? bother you tremendously if your career was being a model exactly. and suddenly you're some kind exactly. of, you know, something that would be very freaky. Exactly. What has the publicity done to your career? Well, the first thing that I did was uh, I went to my agency and I said, do you know where this came from? You shoot thousands and thousands of frames of film in a career and I was working seven years full time in the business so I had no idea where it had come from originally. I was just, I was just floored that somehow I, I assumed that they had taken it out of a catalog that I'd shot in Europe. Or, or did, uh, did it hurt your career as a model? Well, the first thing that I did was when I went to my agency uh, and I uh, got a lawyer to examine the possibilities of of what to do at this point. And yes, it did hurt my career dramatically. Dramatically. You lose faith. First of all, you lose faith in the industry and, and release forms and things like that that you sign daily, you, you mistrust people so dramatically after something like that happens. And not only that, I had to pull my book out of the agency because the, the media hounds were after me. And it's, this is the very, very first time in two years that I've made a public statement. And I've just decided to come out and say, you know, this is not me. <laughs> I would think this not. This is not a real human being. This does not exist. And don't buy it. What about your you know? personal life? Has it, did it affect your personal well, life? Well, I, I had a boyfriend at the time, and I've, that relationship has since ended. And it was a real strain on that relationship as well. I would think well. so. Every party, every dinner. Every, every joke. Mm -hmm. Oh, the jokes. I can't. They're X-rated, yes. you know. You can imagine. Oh. I don't want um, to imagine. No. When we Just come back, that. this woman was once in the Guinness Book of Records for weighing over 1,000 
200 pounds. But when the star printed a horrible article about her life, she decided to take matters into her own hands. We're going to talk to her exclusively. Stay with us. Today we're talking about America's obsession with gossip and tabloid magazines. We don't always think, however, about the truth in each story. Yes? First, I'd like to say, the people that work for these tabloids, I don't understand how they can sleep with themselves, not realizing the pain, the emotional pain they have caused on you people. That's number one. Second of all, Linda Day, George, Miss George, I'd like to say you are a beautiful woman and a very talented woman. Why don't we see more of you on television? Yes, question. Yes, this is for Pauline. Yes. Noticing that you had a nice career going, how long did it take before you got another job after it? For Pauline? Well, what happened to me after um, the second time I sued and it went to trial, when that was over, I, um, I had, a, I guess they call it a delayed stress reaction. I became really depressed for about six months. And I'm usually the kind of person that's real positive and I have a lot of faith and I just get back on that horse. But it really affected me uh, tremendously. And I just couldn't hardly even go out of the house unless it was something real important. I avoided social. Um, interaction and I didn't work and I felt like I almost couldn't work. It's just I needed that time to heal. Um, like I said, the, uh, the article and the lies were, were horrible, but the trial was just as bad, if not worse. And, and you uh, felt that you could do it again? I ended up going back to the job I had been at and I just didn't go out socially and I was real limited and real cautious and almost paranoid, you know, as far as yeah. public. And, We're not uh, what you really need in a private duty nurse. But I really am nurse. changing, and, I, and I'm yeah. in the process of Awful story. changing yes. career. Yeah, what is the cost of bringing lit litigation? <laughs> is it very expensive or not? And are there lawyers who specialize in these cases to fight the tabloid? Let me ask Ken. Ken, you want to answer that for me? The cost to the, to the person of bringing a, a lawsuit. Well. Not the emotional cost. I think she means the financial. I can only tell you from, from our particular case, um, I'm a sole practitioner in Los Angeles. There was three attorneys in Washington, D.C., and two attorneys in Los Angeles at all times on this case. Um, the cost is tens of thousands of dollars, and I know from talking to Pauline on the way over her, I think her case is over $100,000. So it's very costly. You have depositions. Uh, a lot of these depositions are out of state. Some are out of the country. And they do not care how much it costs. They're making money on this. They're going to pay the price. Whoa, okay, thank you. Joining us now is Rosalie Bradford. Rosalie says she spent a great deal of her adult life battling her weight. Rosalie, your weight was not always something that you could control. In fact, at one point you say you reached 1,200 pounds. In excess of 1,200. In, in excess of 1,200 pounds. What happened? What happened uh, yeah. with the weight? Yeah, you turned your life around, <laughs> did you not? Um, well, I always was on the heavy side, but it never affected my lifestyle. Got married, the weight started to escalate after our, we had a baby. I got to about 600 pounds, and I developed a health problem that put me in bed. And then I spent 10 years in bed, and during that time, my weight just doubled. And I was in bed for about a year because of the health problem, but then I had to stay there because I got so big that I, I couldn't do anything. What uh, about the tabloids? What happened to you? Well, as you can see, I, I'm trying to turn my life around. I've lost about 950 pounds. Um, I mean, you know, there are people who lose weight, but that's, that is absolutely amazing. 950 pounds. Yeah, I'm still working on it. And, you know, I really understand it. it's a life lifelong thing. It's not, you know, I do sure. it and I get done. But um, 
after I came out of my prison and got on with my life, went back and finished my education. I have an office in our church where I do some counseling, primarily with weight loss issues. And I was sitting there in the office one day, and one of my people came running in with this paper. Hey, Bradford, you made the paper again. Well, I've done stories with the tabloid, and I was treated very well. But when she showed me this story, I was heart sick. You know, I try and I am a credible person. And a lot of my work and things are focused in the church world. And then I read an article with a paper that I never even spoke to. They talked about things that, about my sex life at 1,200 plus pounds. They talked about my bathroom habits. And they made me sound like all I did besides eat was sit and cry. And that wasn't my life at all. And it, it upset me horrendously because I'm trying to get out there and I want to motivate people and I want to talk about what happened to me with the weight, with some dignity. And then, uh, there you know, goes the you, read, you, you read that and how dare they? I mean, my best friend doesn't even know my bathroom habits at 1,200 pounds. Of course not. You decided to take legal action? Well, I, at first when it happened, I didn't know what to do. You know, and, and sometimes for me, the way I handle things, I set them aside and just let the, the intensity of the feeling settle down. And then people were saying, you need to sue them, you need to sue them. And we did contact a lawyer. And I wanted to sue them simply for the fact, like, how dare they? How dare they take someone's life, some things that are in your life that are so personal? So, I mean, that was a painful 10 years. I would think so. And then they go, and you know, you're trying to get your act together, and they do that. Yeah, your husband, uh, what's his name? Bob. Hi, Bob. This, uh, besides you, there's Bob's sex life. To because you're a very, very special person. I know you did a lot, awful lot of that with Richard Simmons, and so that makes us smile and feel very good. Yes, sir. Yes, now. Comments for uh, Linda. Thank you for all those Mission Impossible, Impossible episodes. They were great. Thank you so much. Why are we so addicted to gossip Sorry. and tabloids? Can they be harmful to us? I think you might be surprised at the answers. We'll find out when we come back. I was really upset. I was livid because I try and talk about my weight issue and my problems that I lived through with some dignity. And when I read this, it was total disgust. You are the power. Get off my stage. I like to hear the stories who's getting married, who's divorced, and why they're getting divorced. And What's happening? Gossip is what America's turned into. It's a shame, and it's, uh, it's, it's just the way it's turned into. Primarily, in the majority of the cases, they're right. I don't read the tabloid magazines because I think they're a waste of time. I just think it's garbage. Who's getting married? Who's getting divorced? Who's going with who? What, where they partied? People like to see where they partied, where they went, what they're doing. That people fantasize but she feels they're right. Well, I don't know what you feel after the show. Joining us now is reporter Richard Johnson. He is the editor for Page Six, which is a gossip column page in the New York Post. Richard, how long have you been doing this? Well, I've been working for newspapers for almost 20 years. I've been at the New York Post since about 1978. When I started, I started in uh, hard news, general assignment reporting. I worked on the rewrite desk. And about 10 years ago, there was an opening in the gossip area, and I moved over there. How do you feel about it? Um, you know, people always say, is it okay if I refer to you as a gossip columnist? I said, yeah, yes. I mean, it, I mean, it doesn't bother me because that's the best description that there is. Sure. It's very hard to describe what makes up a gossip column. Most of it is just regular news. A I lot of it's news that's about celebrities. Very little of it is actual scandal, and very little of it would actually true. hurt somebody's feelings or, you know, no, no matter how true it is. I think we have to, right here, make the difference between the reporting you do and what tabloids are. What I do overlaps with some of what they do. I mean, we cover some of the same stories, and so I can sort of talk from my experience in that, you know, I've had people threaten to sue me, I've had people file suits, and, you know, I have made mistakes and I have run retractions. 
But I don't think that any journalist wakes up in the morning and says, I wonder whose life I can destroy today. I think that, you know, people do make mistakes, and it's, it's a very competitive atmosphere out there. There's like a number of different publications, and the idea is you want to make your story better than their story. And so I think that what's, what feeds the, this uh, tendency to exaggerate or to get inaccurate is the fact that they're competing against other people. They're trying to get people like you to buy that publication. There have been cases, um, I think, for instance, when the National Enquirer was sued by Roseanne. Yes. It turned out that Tom Arnold had actually been cooperating with them and selling them information. Really? Joining us now is Judy Pearson. Judy is a professor of interpersonal communications at Ohio State University. They didn't have classes like that when I when I went to school, Judy, but it sounds very interesting. You've been listening to the stories. What are your feelings about this? Uh, let me just say that, first of all, I'm from Ohio University in Athens, Ohio, not Columbus at okay. Ohio State. Um, right. But I have a professional opinion. I have a non-professional opinion. Give us the professional first. The professional first? Well, I, I wanted to give you the non-professional right. first, which, which is that it's social uh, sewage, I think, is what we're hearing here today. I mean, this is just awful, the, the kinds of stories that we're talking about. My professional opinion, though, would be that um, the, the area of rumor, the area of gossip has always been with us, and it is a significant genre of communication. It's something that we've studied for a long time. It does tell us about our social and cultural values and the organization that we have. You know, you wonder what it does tell us when we listen to the stories like we're listening to today. Uh, but beyond that, I think the other thing that's important to realize is that gossip and rumors in the past were something that two people maybe did over a cup of coffee or over a back fence, and it was about titillation, it was about entertainment, and what we've done now is we've moved it into the public arena, and we haven't applied public discourse models to it. So the ethical standards of verifiability, consistency, accuracy, and so on, which are generally true in other uh, modes of public discourse, aren't being used here, and I think that's what's, what's at stake and what's wrong with the kinds of stories that we're hearing about today. I was going to ask Richard, uh, we're going to assume that a reputable newspaper like the one you work for, that they check the sources. Absolutely, but you know, people do make mistakes. I, I think that uh, we try to check everything and, and we, you know, I, I don't think that anybody will ever run something that they know is wrong because mostly because the people have shown here today that you can get sued. Yeah. And, I, and I like to point out that the cost of litigation, it's not only the people who are suing newspapers, the newspapers have to spend a lot of money. When I write something, I want to make sure that not only will they not win in court if it went to trial, I want to make sure that it will get dismissed before it even gets to trial. Good, good thought. We'll be right back. I think, you know, the real world is the real world, and they're like an escape to the real world, and that's why people like them. It catches people's eyes, I think, especially headlines on the Empire in the grocery store or something. <laughs> You're tempted to buy it and read it. <laughs> I am, anyway. I'll keep reading them just for fun, because I get a good laugh out of them. I think some people read them because they really believe them. But personally, I think there's very little truth to them, but they're entertainment. Are we at the point, I'm asking Judy, do we read more soft news, what I would call soft news, or more hard news? As a country. I, I think we are reading more soft news. Um, we're more interested in relationships and in famous people today than we have been in the past, uh, partly because our own lives in some ways are more meaningless maybe or negative, and so we're trying to overcome those negative lives by learning about famous people. And also another interesting thing happens, and that is that we create what, what we call parasocial relationships, a very technical term, and all it means is that we pretend in our own minds and our own fantasies that we have relationships with these famous people 
people because we read about them, we talk about them, we have opinions on whether they ought to be married or divorced <laughs> or what should happen to them. They're almost like family members after a while. So, so we, What's wrong with our own family, Richard? I think <laughs> yes. that that's partly what's happened though, is it used to be people would grow up in a small town or right. in a neighborhood and they would know all the local people. It would be like an extended family. There'd be a sense of community. And as people have lost that, they have replaced it by reading about Cher or you know, Burt Reynolds, and th that becomes part of their extended community. By the way, I think we have to say, and it was Pauline who brought to my attention, that some lawyers will take these uh, cases on contingency. Yes. I love the New York Post, by the way, especially recently with some of your headlines. Uh, but Thanks. I was wondering, I was sitting here thinking about the TV tabloids. Have anyone been hurt by that? I no, haven't known anybody being sued by the TV. TV, excuse me. What do you mean the TV tabloids? Uh, an affair, hard copy, and that type of thing, you know, because... Uh... Richard would know. I would not know. I think it's a valid point that they, those uh, sort of overlap with the supermarket tabs and that uh, they've sort of gotten off scot-free here today, but I think that they're doing a lot of the same sorts of journalism. And I, one thing I will point out about the supermarket tabs and the TV tabs is that they pay for news, whereas a newspaper like the New York Post does not. And I think that that creates problems because once you're willing to pay somebody five thousand or ten thousand dollars for an Boy, interview, that's very true. It gives them an incentive to make their story more interesting. Very important point. Yes, ma'am. Um, Pauline, you mentioned that you became depressed. Uh, did any of you, other four panelists, have clinical depression or suffer what you feel? I did. Mm -hmm. I did. I had to have counseling because it ruined my reputation. <laughs> it messed up my life, and I couldn't get a job making the money that I was used to making because the people would think that I sold a story mm -hmm. to make money off of them. That's and they what don't, people they, would they assume. We'll be, we'll be right back. Yeah. You are the fact. You're off my stage. Judy, how should a person handle gossip? Well, I think a response to it, an active and direct response to it is, is a correct one. Uh, but taking a conciliatory rather than an inflammatory tone probably is in order. Okay. Jacqueline, are you still in the modeling profession? I haven't been modeling for the last couple of years, no. I have gone on a couple of different auditions and so on. When there's something really special, um, I have been on an audition or two. But even there, there's other working actresses or models that will say, aren't you that girl that, or in the background and your concentration is thrown off. What is your profession at this time? I've been working in uh, the fashion industry, but sort of on the side, working in, uh, you know, manufacturing, that sort of thing. It's Sales, bad too, promotions. Look, looks to me. Those kinds of things. Looks Just to part me time. like she's a special looking kind of person. We'll be right back. <laughs>